nice to be here. And um, I'm 65 years old. Uh, so my body is a lot older than yours, but not my heart. Uh, my heart is where your heart is. And for a couple of minutes, I want to talk about my life, but I do want to talk about making the world a better place, uh, for real. And I've, I line up with Shakur and I line up with Ron. I know what these guys are talking about. As it turns out, I was a potter, so I know about clay. But I also know about not allowing the world to beat you down, man. My story is as a high school kid uh, who was flunking out of public school. And an art teacher happened to save my life, a guy named Frank Ross. I'm walking by the art room door. He made a pot, it was magical. I asked him if he would teach me, he said yes. I cut all my classes for the remaining two years of high school. But I was smart enough to give the teachers whose classes I was cutting the pottery I made. And they gave me passing grades and that's how I got out of the place. And Frank says, you're too smart to die, you're going to college. So he hounded me until I filled out an application to the University of Pittsburgh in pencil. Sent it in, they sent this letter back, said you gotta take the scholastic aptitude test to get in here. Never seen the test, flunked the test. Get in as a probationary student. Graduate with honors. Now I'm a trustee of the University of Pittsburgh. I actually sit on the board. <laughs> and I was the commencement speaker. 13,000 people. And I said, don't give up on the poor kids. It might end up being the commencement speaker. And that story, for the few minutes I'm here, is what I'm going to talk about. People are born into the world as assets, not liabilities. It's all in the way you treat people that drives behavior. And I built a center in Pittsburgh called Bidwell Training Center, Manchester Craftsman's Guild, in my neighborhood. My whole 65 years is six blocks. I was born there and will die in that neighborhood. And part of the reason is I wanted to let the kids know, you don't have to go to the world, you can bring the world to your neighborhood. And so I built this training center for people who had no hope. I went out and raised a whole pile of money. I hired one of the top architects, students in America, a guy named Frank Lloyd Wright, you've heard of him. Well, I hired one of his students to build a world-class training center in the highest crime rate neighborhood in Pittsburgh. And we'll show you some pictures of it. That's my version of what a school for poor kids is supposed to look like. <laughs> if you guys ever come to Pittsburgh and you're all invited, you'll fly into Greater Pittsburgh International Airport. Our building was the scale model for the Pittsburgh Airport. It's a stunning piece of architecture. It has a fountain in the courtyard mainly because I had the checkbook, so I bought one and I put it there. <laughs> but the concept was, I wanted to let kids know that just because you're born poor, man, does not mean that you have to be treated that way. And the, the fancy art museum's got a fountain for their people. I want my kids to have a fountain, so that's why I put it in the courtyard. And the whole idea was, environment changes behavior. Beautiful environments create beautiful kids, prisons create prisoners. That's the entrance to the building. This is a school. Oh, by the way, we have no metal detector, no security cameras. <laughs> we have not had one police call in 26 years. And as God is my witness, when y'all come to visit Pittsburgh, I'll put you in a car and take you to my old high school. It's four blocks away with steel doors and metal detectors and bars in the windows in the same neighborhood is this multi-million dollar training center that has none of that stuff. This is at Christmas time. This is what children are supposed to see when you want to get them out of darkness and put them in the light. That's the boardroom. I hope you eat Heinz ketchup in your hometown. I don't know where your politics are about ketchup, but I stand with ketchup. Um, in the old days, before I got real sophisticated, 
they had a cardboard box built in the school that was in a garbage bag. That looked like a homeless guy dragging this box over Pittsburgh. And I got called into the office of the United States Senator John Hines, who was the heir to the Hines Ketchup Fortune, which was like going to see the Wizards of Oz, because he had about 600 million and I had about 60 cent. He said, man, you've done a great job with the black folks and the poor people, and we understand you want to build a new school. I said, yeah. He said, well, you could really help our affirmative action goals out if you'd had a culinary program, a new school, when you get it built. That way we could hire some black folks and solve the problem. Well, we weren't in the culinary arts back then. We were building trades program. I said, Senator, I'm reluctant to do it. Give me the money. We'll build the school. In a couple of years, I'll come back, and we'll get that culinary program going just like gas. And he sat real quietly. He said, well, what would your answer be if I said I'd give you a million dollars? I said, Senator, it appears that we're going into the food trading business. And uh, <laughs> John gave me a million dollars, and this is what we built. These are poor people going to school to do that. We built an amphitheater for the students. We bring in chefs from all over the world. We have had classes where 100% of the graduates have gone to work in the industry for which they were trained in 12 months or less. One of our chefs. This is lunch at the school. We came to the conclusion it's very difficult to teach people when they're hungry. So the answer is give them something to eat, but we don't do fast food. I know Ron would be happy to hear that. We do gourmet food. And if people tell you that you can't serve gourmet food to poor kids, you send them to Pittsburgh. I've been doing it for 25 years. You just have to want to do it bad enough. That's all pastry. I actually sat down and ate a whole basket one time. It was very good. <laughs> That's our dining room. Looks like your average high school cafeteria in your hometown, right? <laughs> we also train pharmaceutical technicians for the pharmacy industry. You come to Pittsburgh, I'll show you welfare moms doing pharmaceutical applications, as sure as I'm standing on this stage, going to work in the healthcare industry. So we've got it figured out. The only thing wrong with poor people from what we can determine is they don't have any money, which happens to be a curable condition. It's all in the way that you think about people that drives behavior. These are students who were poor once upon a time, but not anymore. This guy was unemployed last year. He's now working for the Water Treatment Authority, making $50,000 a year. I've got about 10 more minutes to tell you this story, so bear with me as the pictures go forward. We have a library with handcrafted furniture. We have people in the library with high school diplomas that they can't read. Not one of them, I got a lot of them. And as God is my witness, we're gonna lose this country if you got kids walking the street with diplomas that they can't read. Why? Because the school systems get paid on how many people they push out the other end. In my center, you learn how to read before you get a certificate because then I know you can survive. This is the arts program. Remember I'm the guy from the 60s making pottery? And I started working in the streets with kids doing clay. And this one of our guys. This is all kids' work, all the people with no ability, remember? Well, what we've discovered is there's nothing wrong with these children. That environment and good food and sunlight and flowers can't cure. In other words, the reason I won the MacArthur Fellowship is I figured out the cure for spiritual cancer. It's called sunlight and hope, and food, and dignity, and decency. You put that formula together, we can solve this problem in every city in this country. This is all children's work. All the guys who supposedly have no hope and no ability. Oh, by the way, 95% uh, of our kids graduated from high school, and 90% of them went to college for the last 20 years in a row. And these are all the kids who supposedly can't learn anything. Look at his eyes. Look at his eyes. That's a guy that's now engaged in learning, man. He's in this conversation big time. Look at his eyes. These are all inner city kids who supposedly can't learn anything. We do photography. Kid that took that picture is now working for Walt Disney Studios. This is the gallery. 
for the poor kids. We have a formal food invitation, formal museum quality invitation. The kids do four shows by the time they graduate in that gallery. This is what my concept of how to treat children from inner city neighborhoods. You treat them as the best human beings that life is capable of producing, and you can solve the cancer that's troubling these kids. <clears throat> the guy on the left, we enrolled him in seventh grade. He went to college and is now back as the director of the program, Jermaine Watkins. This is the old slide. Before I got real sophisticated, went below PowerPoint, I actually had slides in a box with duct tape on the corner and a slide projector. And I got called out to a place called the Silicon Valley. So I showed up on a slide projector, and these people looked at me like I was from Pluto, man. But that's cool. I blew off the dust, plugged in a little slide projector. I told my story, and the lady said, man, fabulous story, but your computer's are getting a little bit old. I ain't no high tech guy, they all look like the same me. I said, well, what do you do for a living? She said, oh, I run a company called Hewlett Packard. I said, well, my dear, there's an instantaneous solution to this problem. And the long and short of it, we got a, almost a million dollars from HP and a systems engineer to go with it. And we now have one of the hippest digital imaging centers east of the Mississippi River. But I keep this slide in here for nostalgia reasons, and you never know when an Apple representative might be in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> this is called a classroom. This is how you're supposed to treat your kids. I also built a music hall, and I'm very glad I did because a trumpet player named Dizzy Gillespie showed up. And I said, why'd you come here? He said, Billy Taylor told me a black guy built this world-class center. I didn't believe one see for myself. And you're too young to appreciate what you built here, but I'm not. And you ought to build one of these things in every city in this country, and I'm going to help you do it. So he allowed us to record his concert. He gave us the rights to the music. Then Herbie Hancock showed up, and Tito Puente showed up and the Count Basie Orchestra, and Nancy Wilson, and Pat Metheny, and Shirley Horn, and Stanley Turrentine. It's been a heck of a run. 600 recordings and five Grammys for a program that's in the middle of a black neighborhood with a high crime rate. <laughs> Look at the faces of the children. This is what kids are supposed to look like when they go to school every day. They look that way coming to my center, so we now know that there's no reason why we gotta be living this way. There's Dizzy, Pat Metheny. Those are the five Grammys that we won. That's our recording studio. This is the audience on opening night. If you'd have dropped a bomb in that room, you'd have wiped out all the rich people in Pennsylvania because they're all sitting there. <laughs> My mother and father, who are on the left-hand side, they're now deceased, but they live long enough to see their kid build the center in the neighborhood and open up black tie. The next night, I had the neighborhood come in. Same food both nights, because I wanted to establish the principle that you don't have to be wearing a tuxedo to be treated with dignity. This was burned out during the riots. I had another box built. I built that. That's a medical technology building. The thing makes money in the middle of a black neighborhood in the middle of the inner city. There's the fountain in the courtyard. <laughs> the bank's in there. Oh, and I also built a greenhouse. We grow orchids. So I have the welfare moms growing orchids in the middle of this black neighborhood. We sell them in the grocery stores and generate money, support school. So we've got that problem figured out. Those orchids. We took first and second prize in the orchid symposium. Welfare moms growing orchids, why? Because it's part of the cure for cancer of the spirit, that's why. And now I'm, we also grow in hydrangeas, and we're growing poinsettias. And now I'm down to the end of the story, and I'm gonna run real fast for four minutes. I was out there at the Silicon Valley with my slideshow, and this young man came out of the audience, he said, man, what a story. I said, cool, man, what are you into? He said, well, I built a company called eBay. I said, oh, great, man, you got a card? Remember, I ain't a techie guy, I never heard of eBay. So I go back to Pittsburgh and ask one of the little techie kids, I said, man, have you ever heard of something called eBay? He said, yeah, Mr. Strickland, that's the Electronic Commerce Network. I said, holy smokes, I met the guy that built the company. So I called him up. I said, Mr. Skull, I've come to have a much deeper appreciation of who you are, man. <laughs> he started laughing. He said, I thought you'd figure it out sooner or later. Here's $500,000. I said, what's that for? He says, your first replication. Dizzy was right. 
I think you're eBay on the social side. And Jeff and I have become very close friends. We built five centers so far. They're open and operating. This is Frisco before it was fixed up. There's Jeff on the right, Billy Wong, and the kids doing digital imaging in San Francisco. There's the space. Every space is beautiful. And those are children who now have a life. They are not losers, they're winners. This is Cincinnati. We cut the dropout rate in Cincinnati to 5% in 24 months, and I don't live in Cincinnati. I live in Pittsburgh. This is the center we built in Grand Rapids for people with no hope. There's the space. Those are photographs of Dr. King taken during the last two years of his life. There's the food facility. That's the dining room. These are some of the guys. Uh, what we discovered on one of the visits, the guys start pulling their pants up. And I said, I got it. Treat people with dignity, they'll pull their pants up. <laughs> This is Cleveland. These are the kids. He records with Alicia Keys. He developed a recording program. These guys graduated from medical tech. This is the one we just opened up in New Haven. Looks exactly like that. Has a waiting list. It's been open less than a year. This is the one we're opening up in Boston. And these three are going to open up by September. And these cities we're now working in. See Chicago? <laughs> Stacy and Kim are right there. Lawndale, we got it hooked up. We're going to start planning this center as sure as you guys are sitting in this room, and most of these centers we're going to get built. Now, those are the cities we're talking to about building centers, and I'm not out looking for work. These are people who have heard about the idea, heard about the concept have decided they want to sign up. And we have two international cities talking to us. We're two countries, Vancouver and Northern Israel. I have a bill I'm trying to get passed in Congress to fund these, and this is a book uh, that tells this whole story. It's big type and it's real short, so you ought to buy the book. <laughs> and let me tell you now, finally, for my next 15 seconds left, why I came here. I came here because of you guys. I came here because this has got to stop, man. We, we can't go on like this. We can't have people dying in the streets because they have no reason to live. And I believe it so much I'm prepared to bet my life that I'm right. The other thing I'm prepared to do is to join forces with you guys to change this country in our lifetime. I'm not doing this for my kid, I'm doing it for me. Because I have a hypersensibility to human suffering, as apparently you do too. And I believe that we can do this in our lifetime. We've got cities open now, we've got centers open. I want to play this hand out and see where it takes me. And the other part of the reason I came here today is to remind myself of this work. Because you know what's in this room right now? Light. L-I-G-H-T. Thanks. <laughs>